grace and peace to all of you and welcome to Sleepy Hollow Presbyterian Church this third Sunday of Lent. What a beautiful day we have here today. So let's lift up our hearts, open up our minds and spirits to be able to hear God's precious loving word for each one of us this day. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who walk on God's sacred path. God's steadfast love guides our feet and lights our lives. We gather to seek God's way with our whole hearts. Let us worship God. that first line again. Please join me in the unison prayer printed on the front of your bulletin, continuing on to the top of page two. Gracious God, awaken us to the forks in the road before us where the ways of the world diverged from your sacred path. Free us from worry, fear, 
and seeing those outside our circle as other. Open us to moral conversation within ourselves and with others. Fill us with your spirit of truth and your holy compassion for all the world's people. Now please take a moment to listen for God's loving message for you this day. If it's the voice of love, it's the voice of God. Amen. Now hear your assurance of grace. The grace of God is the most precious gift you will ever receive. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to be better than anyone else or earn it. It's your free gift. But we have to say yes. We have to say yes actually every day. Opening our heart, opening our mind, and making space in our life for God to plant our feet on God's path so that we keep walking on that sacred path each day. So say yes. Say yes to God's grace and receive this precious gift. Amen. And now as people who have received this precious gift and are forgiven, loved, and have peace in our hearts, let us share the sign of God's peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace. Now, because we have older children here today, it's going to be a little bit of a more grown-up discussion. So, um, Braylon and Abigail, do you want to come and sit over here, or would you rather stay where you are? You can stay where you are. I'll move. I'm happy to move. It's a good test of my knees. Does this work okay, Bao, for me to sit here? All right. Okay. So, thank you all for being here, too. All right, so this is, um, <coughs> we have a very important topic today for children, and actually it's a good topic for um, tweens and teens and for all those at home. Um, because today our topic on the third Sunday of Lent is, uh, it's, a, it's our time to get to know Jesus, really get to know Jesus better, Lent. We make a real intention at the beginning of the six Sundays of Lent, uh, moving towards Easter, to spend a lot of special time trying to get to know Jesus better. And one way we get to know him better is to really read the Gospels, the four Gospels in the Bible that tell us very much about his life and then his death and his resurrection and contain his teachings. So uh, 
passage in the Bible that I haven't really focused adequately on is our focus passage for today, and it's about when Jesus met what the Bible calls the devil in the wilderness. Okay, now maybe I didn't focus on that enough because it was an uncomfortable passage for me. So I don't, I don't know. I, I did preach on it once. I have a Bible at home where I make a note of, you know, what, what is our passage each week. But I haven't visited that passage carefully in a long time. But there is this part in the Bible very early in Jesus' ministry. So, okay, so he's a grown-up, and he's, uh, he's baptized by his cousin John. And when he's baptized, this amazing thing happens. The voice of God comes down in the form of the Holy Spirit, the sign of the, uh, the dove, and says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's the voice of God and the voice of love, and it really puts an anointment on Jesus to be God's holy minister, right? But before he can do his teaching ministry, he goes the Spirit takes him to the wilderness for 40 days, the Bible tells us. 40 is a very special number in the Bible. Uh, it, without putting anyone on the spot, does anybody remember anything that ha that brings up the number 40? And the rain for 40 days and 40 nights, right? And the people of Israel were in the wilderness with Moses circling around for 40 years. 40 is a very important symbolic number. But so Jesus is in the wilderness, and to get closer to God and to be as, you know, as holy and clear in his mind as he can, he doesn't eat for 40 days. Okay, let's take a moment and think about what that would be like. Has anybody here ever fasted for one day? Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, this is a lot of people. Was this a medical necessity or a spiritual thing? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Anybody fasted more than one day? Two days? Okay. How would you feel after two days? Not good. Anybody, anybody really enjoy it and want to go for a third day? <laughs> 40 days is hard to imagine, right? But at the end of the 40 days, what the Bible calls the devil, the Greek word really, diabolos, is devil and is otherwise called Satan and the tempter comes to Jesus. Maybe we can identify best with this by thinking about a voice of temptation. Because has anybody here ever been tempted to do something that you knew you shouldn't do? Okay, Brian's got the hand up first. <laughs> Most honest. Yeah, of course. It could be a silly conversation with yourself about whether to have that donut or not, you know, or a cookie or whatever. Or it could be a more serious conversation. But, but yeah, we all feel, you know, there's a little whisper of temptation, right? Oh, come on. You can tell the teacher that the dog ate your homework and you don't have to be honest and say you really didn't do it or, you know, whatever. So that's that little voice of temptation. So we can relate to that. So this voice of temptation came to Jesus. Now, Jesus' superpowers are truth and transformation and love. And the voice of temptation, this devil was really trying to get Jesus to use his superpowers for selfishness, to be the one who's the most powerful with the devil over the earth, and to turn the stones into bread because he was hungry. A and so this, this temptation was, use your superpower for yourself and to be the most powerful, you know? And Jesus was so clear after 40 days of not eating, he was so clear, and he said, no, I only use my power for good. So what we're going to do today, and I do invite you, if you you're welcome to stay upstairs, but if you want to go downstairs with Piper and Max, this fabulous, um, I don't know if we can zoom in on this, Val, I had saved this. How many years ago do you think we did this, Piper? Maybe four years ago, maybe? Yeah. How old is your sister now? I'm going to say this was five years ago. So uh, I have saved this for five years. <laughs> this is Piper's, we think, we're not positive, okay, of the provenance of this watercolor, but we think that this was done fi about five years ago in our children's program, and we think it's Piper's younger sister, Paige's self-portrait of herself. I bet I could auction this to her mother right now, probably, um, uh, as a superhero, right? 
because you know that that thing that people say, what is your superpower, right? We've heard this, right? What is your superpower? We're supposed to figure out, like, what is it that's special about us that we know we're good at that is our superpower that we can use for good, right? So this wonderful self-portrait of superhero Paige has beautiful little watercolor hearts. Her superpower is love, right? That's one of Jesus' superpowers, too. So it's really important in life to figure out what your superpower is or your superpowers are. What are you really strong at? What are you good at? What do you love doing, you know, that you can use for good? Because whatever our superpower is that we use for good is how we can change the world. And that's the other place where we can meet Jesus in superpower is transformation. Ourself and the world for good, right? So I invite you, if you wish, to go downstairs, if it would be fun, uh, and uh, and do self-portraits. I bet Piper and Max would like to do that. Otherwise, you can stay upstairs for um, the sermon. That's up to you. All right, bless you. First uh, prayer of illumination. May all of our intentions, 
thoughts and actions be directed purely in the service and praise of the divine majesty. Amen. So our first gospel reading is from um, Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The word of the Lord. brought in my theology book this week was one of those weeks are you still using this yes oh good all right and um last week ryan did a wonderful sermon and he did it from one note card which is really super impressive and so i'm going to use my concussion as an excuse of why i have eight note cards (laughs) so that's that's um Little, that's all I can say, Ryan. I'm just using my concussion as an excuse. It's not my age. <laughs> um, so in looking at the Greek this week, I, um, I, de- I just decided that the Matthew parallel to the Mark uh, gospel passage that's in the bulletin ha- has more of the message that I thought the Spirit wanted me to bring to the church today. So you know the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, all tell the uh, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus synoptic seen together from uh you know they they have a great commonality of point of view on the meaning of jesus and the story of his teachings and his 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 um purpose um but uh so we we have uh, study guides that help us with the parallels between the gospels but they are all different and and so we're going to the matthew's account the messian account which is at matthew 15 21 through 28 of this difficult teaching, right, Nancy? We did this in Bible study. It's a difficult teaching uh, from later in Jesus's ministry than the um, passage that Ryan read for us so well. This is the story of the Canaanite woman's faith. Listen for God's word. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the little dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Amen. I am a little 
of dizzy. Oh my goodness. So I'll just hold on to the table. Um, okay. Um, so I, I don't know if all of you remember Betty White. Do you remember Betty White? Yes. Okay. So Betty White, the comedian, she died uh, right, I guess, between Christmas and New Year's, right? Uh, so just like three weeks shy of her 100th birthday. Very amazing. And she has, there's many famous quotes of Betty White, and some of them are pretty funny. This one is more serious. You don't luck into integrity. You work at it. You don't luck into integrity. You work at it. Okay, what is integrity? Well, integrity is the quality of being honest. Oh, Corey's getting me a stool. Thank you. I think the problem is just when I look up and down. But I'll, I'll take it just in case. I don't want to make anybody nervous. Thank you so much. I'm really fine. I'm totally fine. But in case I fall backwards again, I have a stool. Um, so integrity is the quality of being honest. Okay. And being of strong moral principles. So the other definition of integrity, we think of like the integrity of a building or something like that, right, is being um, whole and undivided. But that, that goes with the first definition, right? Because when we are being rigorously honest and cleaving to our moral principles, we are whole and undivided. We have integrity, right? So this is this life of integrity that God calls us to on God's sacred path, that Betty White says you have to work at it. And it is something that we have to work at. We do have to work. It doesn't, we don't just relax into a life of integrity. You know, integrity probably many, many times, maybe most times, is really not our comfort zone. It's not our default position. It's something that we have to be intentional, choose, work at. And it is what God is calling us to do. So how do we do this? All right. One step is we need to tune in to the voices in our head and start untangling them enough to have moral conversation with ourselves, right? My whole life really changed. Oh, my gosh, how many years ago was this? I've handed copies of this book to some of you. Um, I'm just going to, well, it was before I went to seminary, so I'm going to guess and say 25 years ago, I went to a wonderful therapist in Mill Valley, Pam Butler, and uh, her book was called Talking to Yourself. And uh, I, I've handed a lot of this, these out to people here in the congregation. It was so helpful to me. It was life-changing, that good transformation that Jesus does to make us more whole and more filled with love. Her book, Talking to Yourself, helps us to start turning the volume up enough on the voices in our head that we hear. Now, at first, it's a, what is the word, cacophony? <laughs> it's like, ah, there's a lot of voices in my head, you know? And some of them are self-critical because almost every single one of us, probably everyone, has at some time in their life had either a parent, a teacher, a sibling, a somebody who was pretty negative and critical. And we take in children really soak up those unfortunately uh, children really soak up those judgmental voices. And it's very, very hard to turn the volume down on those really kind of mean self-critical voices that can drive people through their whole life. It's important to turn the volume up on it enough to hear it so we can engage in a conversation and say, no, thank you. You know, that voice is no longer helpful to me that mean voice that tells me that I'm less than who I am, that I'm not what God is calling me to be, that voice is no longer helpful. So then we can really very intentionally turn the volume down on that voice. The other voices of the culture that say, work harder, make more money, be faster, be best, we need to turn the volume down on those too. I mean, it's important to have a little bit of drive so that you want to do well at things, right? But it needs to be tempered by the voice of reason, by the voice of proportion to right size it. So w the goal really is to get to the place where the voice of the Holy Companion, the Spirit of God, is the voice that you hear. And that companion voice then accompanies you through your life, lays before you the sacred path, the path of integrity, and makes it clear what is the moral choice? What is the choice that's true to you? 
what should you be doing with your one wild and precious life, as poet Mary Oliver said, right? When that voice of the Holy Companion, remember we believe in the God, the Creator, the Compassion, and the Holy Companion. When the voice of the Holy Companion that Jesus gave us to teach us and remind us, because he knew we would need daily reminders of who he is and what he wants for us, when that voice is the front voice in our head, we make good choices, and our life feels like we have integrity. So th this, is, this is what that book's pointing me in the direction of, and the gospel. Jesus is so clear in the wilderness when he's tempted by the tempter, the devil, because he's relying on scripture in part. He quotes scripture, Deuteronomy 8, right? Man shall not live by bread alone. He quotes scripture, Psalm 91, Nancy's father's favorite, right? He, he's, he has something to fall on. Plus, he is the truth. Jesus is our light of truth, shining on the world to help us discern truth. No, no, that's not truth. So he's so, so clear. And in the third temptation, when the devil offers him power over the whole world, if only he will worship the devil, he says no. He chooses not to have that dominating power. Now that is really very important. In the world today, too many people say yes to that temptation. That's what's happening right now on the other side of the world, breaking our hearts, is that Vladimir Putin has said yes to that devil, that t tempter, that dominating power, that evil that says, these people are not really human, right? War rests on lies. The, the fundamental lie beneath all war is the dehumanization of people. You know, the lies and the pretexts that take away people's humanity that make war an acceptable option. And that is what is happening on the other side of the world. So we pull out, whoops, our theology book, and we look back because so many people are asking, where is God in Ukraine? You know, if we've been taught, and, and, and as children, uh, uh, certainly I was taught as a child in the church back in Virginia, that God is almighty. God is omnipotent. As Calvin, who is a pretty fundamental theologian for Presbyterians, Calvin would often say, not a hair drops from a head, not a sparrow falls outside of God's plan. Everything is God's plan, and God is almighty. Calvin, as this wonderful theologian, the author, Princeton scholar, who's the author of the um, current Presbyterian Seminary, Faith Seeking Understanding, an Introduction to Christian Theology, Daniel Migliori. As he says, Calvin was walking a real tightrope by s giving everything to God's plan. He was basically taking everything away from human free will and, and, and making life seem completely preordained, double predestination, right? So we have to look at how that functions. On the one hand, I'm a functional theologian. If you believe that everything that happens, even Putin, even the war in Ukraine, it's all God's plan, I suppose that could make you feel a little less anxious, maybe. But we have to look at God through the lens that Jesus gives us. Jesus is compassion. The Jesus that we know from the Gospels would never say it's God's plan to hurt all those people in the Ukraine. I, it cannot be God's plan. So then we say, well, what is it? What is it? And I'm thinking, Ryan, not to put you on the spot, but I am, we should probably offer something this holy time of Lent, maybe even Holy Week, that would be a discussion. We could do it by Zoom or in person about what Presbyterian theology is teaching now about the mystery of evil. Where is God in, in world events that show us the, the strength, the power, and the, and the horror of evil? Where is God? How do, we, how do we understand, to the extent we can, this mystery, right? The important thing is to remember that Jesus comes to teach us that God is love 
God is truth. God is transformation. God is never dehumanization. God is never violence that hurts people and children. And so we are called to resist evil. We are called to resist, oppose, and counter evil with every superpower that we have. With our words to speak the truth. Never, ever to concede that another person is anything less than human. This is our superpower, is truth. Once we turn down the confusion voices in our head and align ourselves clearly with God's truth, God's holy companion, we will have that clarity. We can take heart that Jesus, in the Matthew 15 passage, had to engage in a moral conversation with the Canaanite woman to be reminded that his ministry was not just to the people Israel. Jesus, even Jesus. Nancy says, that doesn't sound like Jesus in Bible study, right? Because it was a moral conversation. The woman came to him. She's not a Jew. She's a Canaanite, which the Jews thought meant pagan, their enemy. And she's like, please, please, Lord, heal my daughter. And he says something that sounds so derogatory in the English, right? It's like, well, I've come just for the house of Israel and, you know, and uh, I have to feed, feed the children of Israel. And she counters him and says, the, the word dogs is very harsh sounding. And in the Greek, it's like puppies more, the little dogs, the little house dogs. It's, it's still not good. But uh, and he's, and he's like, she counters him and says, but even the little dogs get the crumbs beneath the table, you know. Your ministry has to be able to extend past the people Israel. And he agrees with her like this. And he heals her daughter, right? And in that amazing moment, which is told in the Synoptic Gospel, so it was a very important story that all the evangelists picked, the three Synoptic evangelists picked up. In that story, Jesus takes this leap outside of a, ethnically defined ministry to the house of Israel into a universal ministry that affirms the full humanity of the Gentiles, the Greeks, the non-Jews. What a step, right? If he had stayed within those boundaries and said, I'm here just for the Jews, all of history would be different. He said, no, oh, this woman, she, she convinced him. She convinced him that her daughter was just as human and worthy of healing as anyone else. And he agreed. That's our model. We, we say, you know what? It's so easy to get pulled into dehumanizing, especially if somebody's mean to us or we don't know them or they're on the other side of the world or we've been told a bunch of lies about them. But we need to have the conversation with ourselves and others to get ourselves back to the goal, which is truth and full, full humanization, the opposite of the hate and the wars that are happening now. So I'll close with just a little example. So um, last summer we went to the beach with my son and his family, and, uh, and I had noticed a l possibly a tiny bit of tension arising between me and my son and his wife because when my granddaughter, Grace, uh, who's six, was what I considered to be showing an uh, well, <coughs> I don't know if I should say this on camera, an appalling lack of manners. <laughs> I would correct her <laughs> because I definitely, I grew up in the South and I think children should say please and thank you and make eye contact and I think... Maybe this is very old-fashioned, but I think that, you know. And so my son and I, <laughs> tack of the vapors, <laughs> my son and I went for a walk on the beach to sort of talk this out, you know, and he expressed his opinion. 
this turned out this was a moral conversation, right? He, uh, this is a long walk. <laughs> he expressed himself that he thought that if you're always like, of course, I do accompany a little say please or thank you with like a little nudge in the back, like a little pokey finger, which is probably a little overbearing. But, but he said, you know, when you're, when you're uh, telling children all the time, you, know, you have to say please, you have to say thank you, whatever, uh, it's like it takes away their freedom. Now, he is not a right-wing political person, but he actually was talking about, a ch basically the way I interpreted it, I tried to call him yesterday to clear this, make sure that he, you know, I wasn't misquoting him, but, uh, but he did not return my call. <laughs> so <coughs> in any event, so now I'm free, right? So, uh, so at any event, his point of view was simply that if you're constantly jabbing at your child saying, say please, say thank you, make eye cut, whatever, you know, that, that they feel it's sort of robotic perhaps and not like sincere. I'm thinking, gee, he really resents me for being such a fanatic about teaching him manners <laughs> all those years. But in any event, so I said, well, here's the deal, son. I'm obviously a true believer in the Lordship of Jesus. I teach Jesus. I try my best to follow Jesus. And fundamentally, Jesus stands for the universal human dignity of all people. And that is the way in my mind and heart to world peace. If we can get to a place of believing in and living into universal human dignity for all people in the spirit of Jesus, a lot of the problems of the world would go away. So I think it starts when children are little by these little teeny ways, please, thank you, eye contact, that we remember that the other person is fully human, just as human as we are. We don't disregard somebody, take something without saying thank you, ask for something without saying please, not look at the person. That makes them an object. We need to work every single day to make people, all people, just as human, just uh, to remember they are just as beloved by God as we are. That's the path. That's the path of integrity. May we all live it. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, let's all settle down in our seats and those at home. I know you're all settled in your seats. Um, and uh, let's bring our hearts together and lift them up in prayer. Holy One, God of holy mystery, God who loves all people, all people. We ask that you clarify for us which is your voice, that voice of love, that voice that is our holy companion of love and wisdom and truth and transformation. That we might walk your path in your truth and your love, be healed so that we can be healers. We ask 
that we are able to do everything that we've been equipped to do to help bring peace to this world. We know that your presence is in Ukraine, God. We know that your presence is there feeding the hungry, giving hope to the hopeless, healing those who are wounded, comforting the bereaved. We ask that all the world can gather around, can amplify your goodness and work for peace. We pray always in the Lord's Prayer to deliver us from evil. Guide us so that we do not ever empower evil. Energize us to resist, oppose, and counter evil with every fiber of our being. We pray for all those in Ukraine and in the refugee recipient countries and all over the world who are struggling with every kind of difficulty. We still pray for healing for those with COVID, especially for those with long COVID, hope, energy, and healing to all those suffering. We pray for those who are suffering with aging and memory problems and loneliness. God, fill, fill us with your hope and with your love and with your peace. Guide this church to continue to grow our food and feed the hungry and bring hope to the hopeless and friendship to the lonely and in every way to live your love. God, in your grace, you hear our prayers. Those at home, please feel free to post your prayers on Q&A if you'd like them shared with the congregation. You hear our prayers. Sharon. Carol and Rita. Prayers for Carol and Rita. God in your grace. For our young people, some of whom have been struggling with so many problems because of COVID and school being in and out, and may they find the peace of Christ in their hearts filling their spirit, and for their dear parents who love them so much, comfort, peace, and hope. God, in your grace. Um, let us um, say the Lord's Prayer. And please use the name for God that brings you closest to God. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the time of the offering, I want to really put a big thank you to all those who are growing tomatoes at home. Um, I, let's see, Jody, how are your tomatoes doing? <laughs> 
Okay, Nance, do you still have tomatoes at home? All right, that's good. Michael, uh, Millie, you're growing. Millie's got 85 tomato plants at home. Oh, my gosh. Is there anyone else I'm not recognizing here who's growing tomato plants for the sale in the garden? Ryan, how are yours doing? Still alive. <laughs> this is going to be so interesting when we see these all brought back to the church. So this year we did a big, uh, ambitious uh, community partnership thanks to Patty Vance I know watching at home and Michael and Patty led this effort with the homeowners association and um, we have oh my goodness Michael 26 people right growing tomatoes okay all right so we've gone to 20 people and we're getting to the finish line and the goal is uh, to have the sale April 2nd and then uh, the, the Michael will take out the plants for the Justice Garden, and uh, and then we'll sell the rest in the parking lot here, and it all goes to uh, feed the hungry. So we're so so grateful to all of those of you. It's a very big commitment to nurture all those tomato babies, and uh, and w it's a wonderful way to um, show our love for the earth and our love for our neighbors to feed the hungry with that. So that's an enormous offering. Thank you all for all of that and all the many ways that you give to the church. The morning offering will now be taken. Just to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify my heart, cleanse me from within. me from my sin and deep within refine as fire my heart's one desire is to be holy and set Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. I am ready to do your will. Please join me in prayer. Holy One, we trust that these, our generous gifts, will be put to good and faithful use, bringing about a more just and peaceful world for all people. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, now we come to announcements. So I already sort of announced that we're coming up on the tomato sale April 2nd.
right? And there might be a little bit of a pre-sale. I think the details have not yet been announced, so watch the newsletter for that. Um, very important announcement. One week from today, March 27th, is the annual meeting of the congregation where we will thank our outgoing elders, uh, and they, all the elders will give a report brief, which will also be blasted out in this week's newsletter um, on their area of church life, and then we'll elect our new officers, our incoming elders, and, um, and the congregation will review the budget, vote on my compensation package, and I think that's it, right, Jody? That's it. <laughs> yes. And Jody will give a wonderful speech about Presbyterianism. <laughs> no, <laughs> she might. <laughs> At any rate, it's going to be immediately following. And then um, I understood that there might be a little special birthday something uh, happening next Sunday, too. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't want to miss it. Um, so that's next Sunday. Yes, Michael. The celebration of Ryan and Olivia's wedding is, is it Friday or Saturday? I thought it was Friday. Yes, yeah, so you won't be with us next Sunday, but we, we blessed you last week when Olivia was still here, right? And we'll be praying for you on Friday. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Abandoning. So we just need a foster parent for 40 tomatoes to take them from Ryan's trunk. <laughs> oh, yay. Thank you, Jen. Okay, that's good. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, you two get together. You get together with Jen. Yes, Michael is uh, very available. He has a 24-7 green thumb hotline. Um, so... Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's it. So, yeah, feel free to call on him. Okay, good. So we arrange that. And then, Sharon, your announcement, please. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Racial Equity Team. Uh, the Racial Equity Team, we, we post the it's Zoom meetings uh, still, and that's in the newsletter. If you're interested in joining the, the groups, there's two groups, the, the monthly meeting and then also the book club, and they're just great studies and discussions. And this is a wonderful project that came out of the uh, Racial Equity Team, as Sharon said, and we do have the collection box in the narthex till April 3rd. Um, it's just a sweet thing to do. Jody works at San Pedro Elementary School on Wednesdays in the after school program and has really witnessed the kids trying to play with shoes falling off their feet, you know, et cetera. So this is a, just a wonderful way to make a real solid direct difference in the lives of those children. So thank you for participating. Of course, Piper. A uh, Piper. Ah, KC, mother of Piper. Well, we asked that question of Michelle. Uh, wha who's the coordinator's name? I'm getting mixed up with Laurel Dell. The school coordinator said, this time let's do the new. So we're going to stick with the new this time. So she'll have it in her office and be able to hand out new, which is a self-esteem thing, I think. Yeah. But, but a lot of us have these barely used, uh, you know, sweatshirts and shoes. So we may try to go with that next time or... Oh, good. There's a beautiful connection. 
Yes, yeah, Sharon has a great connection in the Canal community through her work as a nurse and um, uh, doula, right word? Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, she would be very happy. to. Uh, so that's great. This is why we gather in person, so we can make these connections and do more good in the world. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's stand and sing our final hymn. Great is thy faithfulness, God our Creator. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou Receive now your charge and blessing. So as you go out from here in this holy season of Lent, take that moment each day, if possible through the day. Turn all the other voices down. Listen for the voice of God, the voice of truth, the voice of love, the voice of personal and world transformation. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.